think we'll get started. Uh, today I'm happy to present one of our own, Dr. Jay Rosenheim. He's been a member of the department for over 20 years. So he says he does not need an introduction, and you guys should be familiar with the excellent work of he and his lab member. So today he will be talking about observational and eco-informatics approaches in ICM research, expanding the applied insectologist toolkit. Thanks, Kelly. Um, well, I, I wanted to um, start by thanking uh, Kelly and the graduate students for inviting me to talk. Uh, you know, I think all of us run around and give talks at national meetings and sometimes in other departments, but it's it's kind of a special treat to be able to stay at home and, and uh, present some of the uh, so, uh, uh, so the goal of the work that I'd like to talk about today is basically to sort of try and open a discussion with the community of applied insect ecologists about the possible advantages of sort of broadening the toolkit that we use a bit to move um, perhaps a little bit away from such a strong reliance on experimental work and to think a little bit instead about the maybe complementary um, values of using observational approaches. And in particular, um, approaches that use data that are not necessarily being collected by us, the researchers with our own hands, but potentially using data that are being generated by farmers and consultants who are working in commercial agriculture. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about. Um, before um, I start the work, I wanted to acknowledge um, some of my collaborators. There are a lot of people who contributed to the work that I'll be presenting. Um, so this first group, so Saroosh, Billy, Yalwami, <coughs> Francis, and Tanya, were um, basically all members of the lab about a year and a half ago, and we all worked together to do a review of the literature that um, I'll present in a few minutes. So that was work that we all worked on together. Um, the second group, um, Rachel, Emily, um, Kim, Gail, Andy, and Andrew all contributed to the um, experimental field work that I'll be presenting. Um, Keith Goodell is a IPM specialist, part of the UC IPM program. Um, he was crucial in connecting um, me with consultants in the industry and with farmers, so his, his contribution was really essential. Um, Jim Jones is a private software developer who's here today. He um, designed the database that made the whole pro project go, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then this last group of individuals, um, Kevin Gross, Yves Carrier, and uh, Pierre de Blue, are, also, are all um, biostatisticians. And that's a key part of the work I'll be um, presenting, but I won't go into it today, so I'm sort of going to really not do that justice. But the, the statistical issues are key as part of this work, and so that is definitely uh, their contributions are really super appreciated. OK, so um, here's sort of a roadmap um, for what I'll be talking about. So first, I'll try to define eco-informatics, this approach of using um, data from farmers and consultants. Um, I'll then sort of lead what I hope will be maybe a bit of a discussion about the strengths and weaknesses of experimental approaches versus observational approaches. And I'll try to focus that discussion a little bit by viewing it through the lens of a yield impact study. So one of the core studies that IPM researchers do, trying to quantify the relationship between pest density and crop yield. Um, and then, essentially for the last chunk of our time, I'll walk through two examples that try to show how observational data sets can play complementary roles in research projects. So the first example will involve a very small, modest um, observational data set, and the second one will involve a larger data set coming from, again, the um, uh, private farmers. And that'll essentially be my attempt to sort of uh, share with you a proof of concept that this eco-informatics approach can actually and definitely feel free to interrupt. Um, I'm happy to field questions or hear suggestions as we go along. OK, so eco-informatics, what, what exactly is it? Uh, eco-informatics, I think, is sort of a growth industry right now in the field of ecology. Um, it's new. It's somewhat ill-defined still. But I would say that most eco-informatics studies have most, if not all, of these characteristics. First, they tend to use pre-existing data. So they're all, almost all, to one degree or another, an exercise in data mining. Um, second, they often involve integration of data from multiple sources with all of the challenges associated with dealing with heterogeneous de data sets. Usually, the data are observational rather than experimental. Not always, but usually. Um, many eco-informatics studies um, allow ecologists to address um, ecological processes that are occurring at large spatial or temporal scales, scales at which experimentation is often quite difficult. Um, finally, eco-informatics studies often involve relatively large quantities of data. And the fact that these 
data sets are large and heterogeneous typically means that to do one of these projects well, we need to have novel and efficient tools for organizing the data, managing the data, so database design is crucial, and we need typically novel tools for um, analyzing the data, so novel um, statistical approaches. So eco-informatics then in a nutshell is often an endeavor that involves collaborations between computer scientists, between um, statisticians, and between ecologists to address these sort of broad scale um, questions in ecology. Okay, so if eco-informatics then is focused on data mining, the first and absolute prerequisite is that there has to be some pre-existing set of data that are potentially useful. And in the field of pest management research, I think we have a tremendous opportunity to adopt this approach because there is a vast quantity of pre-existing data. And these are data that come from the routine sampling efforts that farmers and consultants are doing every day, every year, out in commercial agriculture. So almost all farmers are monitoring their fields to understand when they have a potentially damaging population of pests. Typically, at the end of the season, those data are either thrown away or they're put in a dusty locker somewhere. And so what we're suggesting is maybe that is a treasure trove of useful information. Um, because the labor-intensive job of sampling insects is decentralized, uh, we can potentially generate a huge amount of data, much greater data sets than we could do if we as researchers have to generate those data that are only us. But, of course, these are observational data. So they're not being generated in an experimental context, and that then opens up questions as to you know, can we extract useful um, results, useful research results from these strictly observational data. So um, we've been sort of focused on that question then. You know, is there real value in these observational data sets? And what are the potential strengths and weaknesses of experimental science versus observational science? Of course, pest management is a diverse endeavor. There are many, many different kinds of questions that are being asked, and they are addressed with many, many different sorts of approaches. So to focus this question a little bit more, we decided to look at this issue of the relative strengths and weaknesses of experimental science versus observational science by looking at the question through the lens of the yield impact study. So the yield impact study is basically something that almost all IPM researchers have to do at the outset of a program. We need to understand at what density does a particular pest generate enough damage that it's important for a farmer to intervene to protect that crop. Okay, so I worked with members in my, in my lab to do a little review of recently published yield impact studies. So we looked at all of the studies that were published in Journal of Economic Entomology and Environmental Entomology, two sort of bastions of applied pest management research um, over this three year period from 2007 to 2010. And these are the data that we collected. So we asked, was the study observational or experimental? So what are we doing? Uh, were the data collected by the researchers themselves or was it, was it potentially collected by others? Um, was the research being conducted on a research farm or was it being done in a commercial setting? Um, we wanted to ask some questions about the spatial scale in which the work was being done. So in the case where there were experiments, what was the spatial scale of the research plot? And then finally, we wanted to gather some data on statistical power. And I'll, I'll come back to that. And the results of this review sort of gave us a sense of where are we? Like, what's the status quo? And what we found, not surprisingly, is that experimentation is definitely the mother's milk of pest management research. So we found 36 uh, yield impact studies that had been published during this interval. Um, all but one of them was an experimental study, strictly experimental. There was only one study that, that used uh, observation. In 100% of the studies where the methods were described in adequate detail, um, the data were collected by the researchers themselves. So we're very jealous about how we do our research. We want to be totally controlled. And finally, most of the studies, um, 22 out of 25, where the methods were described adequately, we could see that the research was being conducted in a research setting on a research farm rather than in a, in a commercial setting. So clearly, where the field is currently is we have enshrined the value of experimentation to a very great degree. And I think there are a lot of good reasons actually for doing that. We're all taught to do that, and I think we appreciate um, the, the manifold advantages of doing experimental science. And I've sort of tried to put up, this is sort of my top five list of why it's really useful to do 
Um, and I don't think there are any surprises here to anyone. So by far, perhaps the most important issue is the strength of a causal inference that we can derive from an experimental study. So if you do an experiment and you see a response, you know that there's a causal effect between the variable that you manipulate and the response there. On the other hand, if you're working with observational data sets, mm -hmm. with the CP point dramatics approach, you're dealing strictly with correlations. We know that correlation is not the same as causation, so we're going to be have challenges. Experimental approaches can also be um, advantageous because they're fundamentally very flexible. Any variable that, that we, the experimenter, can manipulate, can, can figure out a way to manipulate, we can explore. Whereas with observational data sets, we're sometimes going to be hamstrung because we can only work with that variation that is naturally present in the field. We're not generating that variation, so we have to just work with what we have. And we'll actually see this problem come up in one of the examples over here. Another potential advantage of experimental sciences is that we, by controlling the conditions under which we do the experiment, we can reduce the between replicate variation. That then gives us greater statistical power, whereas with observational data sets, the heterogeneities create a lot of between replicate uh, variation, and that can erode our statistical power. Another uh, key advantage, and this was, I think, when we actually started the work and we started trying to write grant proposals, this was the key hurdle that we ran into, that reviewers said, you know, if you work with observational data, the data uniformity is going to be too low, the data are going to be incomplete, and the data quality is simply not going to be good enough. We have, there were deep-seated concerns that the raw quality of data that were being generated by farmers and consultants was not going to be high enough to support sort of rigorous research. So that was sort of a key question. And then finally, there's an issue of the sensitivity of the data, which I don't think we fully appreciated when we started, but it's become a greater issue. That when you're doing experimental research at a farm, there, the, 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 there's no sensitivity of the data. We generate the experiments, it's our data, there's no problem. When instead we're relying on farmers or consultants to share their data with us, you can run into some real obstacles. Um, farmers are notoriously secretive about their production practices and about their yield results. And so it may be, in many cases, difficult to get farmers to be willing and to have the trust level to actually share those data with us. So this is a pretty good set, I think, of advantages for sticking with experimentation. And you might conclude from this, well, we'd have to be absolutely loopy to even dream about doing anything other than experimentation. But I think um, that, in fact, there are some reasons, nevertheless, to think about looking outside of experimentation. And I think there are some weaknesses of experimentation that are less widely considered and less widely appreciated by the research community, and I want to try and sort of walk through some of these now. So again, I'll try and present sort of a top five list of why we might want to look beyond strict experimentation. So the first of these has to do with the spatial and the temporal scale at which experiments are conducted. And typically, these are small scales, much smaller than the spatial scale at which agriculture is conducted. So if we look at our yield impact studies that we saw in the literature, um, the mean size of the replicate plot was 37 meters squared. So that's a six meter by six meter plot, or whatever that is, 0 0.0037 hectares. And this is much, much smaller, of course, than the scale at which commercial agriculture is being conducted. And it's a perennial concern for ecologists that if you measure a process at one scale, it may not be a guarantee that we can simply extrapolate to a different spatial scale. But in many cases, key processes change as you change the spatial scale. There also may be a problem with the temporal scale. So when we looked at our survey of studies, we noticed that 100% of those studies involved annual crops. Now, why should that be? You can do a yield impact study with a perennial crop, but it's very difficult because perennial crops may show um, cumulative effects of herbivory, there may be lag effects of herbivory. So to do a yield impact study, you, do, you need to do a multi-year study where you maintain press perturbations, you maintain the treatments over a long period of time. Very, very difficult. So difficult and so costly that it's very, they're done, but very infrequently. So if you want to study um, the impact of a pest on a perennial crop, observations may be much, much more attractive because with observational studies, of course, 
the spatial and temporal scale of the research of the data matches exactly the spatial and temporal scale of commercial agriculture. Okay, so that's maybe advantage number one. Here's advantage number two. And this is basically taking one of the strengths of experimentation and sort of turning it on its head. Um, what, what kind of applicability do we have um, when we're taking a recommendation derived from an experiment and trying to apply it to the broad range of conditions under which farming is actually conducted. And this can be a real problem with experimentation. We control conditions very tightly. We may have what statisticians call high internal validity. So the, the conclusions that we draw from the experiment may be applicable to that set of conditions under which the experiment is conducted. But we usually want to make recommendations for all of agriculture, let's say, all the farmers in a particular region that are growing that particular crop. And eco-informatics-based approaches can, I think, do a much better job of achieving what's called external validity. That is, if you plan um, carefully the way you gather the data, you can gather the data from a full range of conditions under which farming is actually being conducted. So in fact, it was suggested that rather than trying to tighten our control of conditions, that instead purposeful heterogenization of the data set may actually be a more valuable goal. Okay, how about the third um, strength of observational approaches? This has to do with the how many variables can we sort of cope with at once. And I think it's true that for most experiments we're running, we're able to manipulate and really treat just a small handful of variables at a time. You know, once you get even to four or five variables, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, but eco-informatics-based approaches can potentially be useful for screening a vast number of different variables. And this can be especially important when we have IPM research projects that are not tightly focused, but rather are much more sort of in an exploratory phase. And we'll actually see an example of this in just a couple of minutes. Um, a fourth potential advantage of observational methods has to do with how easy is it to translate the results of a research project into a recommendation for farmers. And I think this is actually a challenge that's um, often sort of not really contemplated so much. Researchers often are speaking a different language than the farmers are speaking. So we may do our sampling differently, we're measuring things differently. And so when we get done and we have a particular result, we have to figure out how to translate that result into the language that the farmers are speaking. In contrast, when we work with data derived directly from the farmers, there's an immediate translatability. There's no risk that something's going to be lost in translation because the raw data are exactly in the format that the farmers are, are familiar with. So that's, I think, another advantage. And finally, a last advantage has to do with the issue of statistical power. Just how large are the data sets going to be? For experimental approaches, the data sets are generally fairly small because we're constrained by how the data that we can actually collect ourselves. With eco-informatics approaches, we can potentially get much larger data sets because of that decentralization of the labor-intensive mm -hmm. business of sampling, and that holds out the promise of having greater power of these potential. So we wanted to look at this last issue a little bit more carefully with our literature review. And we saw that the surveys, the studies that we surveyed, there was a mean number of replicates per treatment of four. Or actually, a mean, sorry, of four. That was the, that was the median value. And the question was, is that enough? Or is that really going to give us sufficient power? And as soon as you start thinking about power in applied insect ecology, you immediately run into a key challenge. And the challenge really has to do with the economics of crop production and crop protection. So here's the problem. Crops are valuable. Insecticides are cheap. So let's take an example. <coughs> a typical acre of Pima cotton might be worth $2,000. Okay, that's not a particularly high value crop, sort of run part of the course. A typical insecticide application that a farmer might contemplate um, using to protect that crop is very cheap. It might only cost $20 per acre. That includes both the cost of, let's say, flying an airplane around and the cost of the material itself. So here's the rub then. The farmer is going to be motivated to apply that insecticide if he thinks he can protect $20 worth of that crop. And that, represent only, that represents only 1% of the total yield in that crop, right? $20 out of 2,000 is 
Now, if you come to me as an experimentalist and say, I'm going to hire you to go out and measure a yield effect of 1%, my teeth are going to start chattering. Okay, that's going to make me pretty nervous. So we wanted to ask then, can we generally measure the effect sizes that really matter to farmers? Can we measure the effect sizes on yield that actually correspond to the decision point that the farmers are actually having to cope with? And so to address that question, we went back to our literature survey, and we collated the relevant, the relevant information. So we took out the information on crop value, on the cost of insecticide application, and the key stuff to, that allowed us to measure statistical power, so variance and the number of replicants. And for each of these studies, we measured this thing, we calculated this, a power ratio, as the smallest proportional yield loss that we could detect with 50% probability. So this is, okay, we've got a reasonable chance of measuring an effect of this size. So this is what can we measure. And then in the denominator, the smallest proportional yield loss that would actually motivate a farmer to spray, right? So this is the effect size that actually matters to the farmers. And of course, what we want is we want to have that power ratio be less than one. Okay, we want to be able to measure effects that are small enough that it actually allows us to give advice to the farmer about the decision that the farmer has to make. And here's what we found. So I'm plotting here this power ratio on the x-axis. Here's the sort of magical cutoff, okay? We want that value to be less than one. So to the left would be sufficient power, to the right would be insufficient power. Notice that this is plotted on a log scale. So each of these categories is a two-fold increase in this power ratio. And what you can see is it's, it's a sad story, okay? Not one of the studies we reviewed had sufficient power to allow the researchers to actually quantify the effect size that matters to farmers. And so this, I think, then, really generates a very profound disconnect between the kinds of things that we are able to document as researchers experimentally and the kinds of effects that actually matter to farmers. And because we have that profound disconnect, I think this is one of the contributors to the, the, the feedback that I think we all hear from the farming community, that they often feel that what we're doing here is sort of disconnected from reality, that we're not really bearing down necessarily on the problems that they think you know, are most important. So I think there are many issues underlying that, but I think this is one of the contributors. Okay. So to sum up then this first sort of chunk of the, of the talk, um, I've suggested that as um, pest management researchers, we tend to rely very heavily on experimentation. That's what we've been taught to do, and that's what we do. Um, but experimentation, like any approach to research, has both strengths and weaknesses, okay? The strengths are manifold and they're widely acknowledged, but the weaknesses, I think, are also there. And so I think then we have some motivation, potentially, for looking to other kinds of research approaches that can complement the strengths of experimentation. And I think as we've seen in this little review, in many cases, the strengths and weaknesses of experiment experimental approaches and observational approaches are actually really are complementary. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is sort of spend the rest of our time sort of walking through two sort of case studies, just two examples. And I'm hoping that both of these examples will show the potential value of using observational approaches in a sort of hand-in-hand -hand with experimental approaches. And the first of the examples has to do with the impact of Ligus hesperus, so the key merit pest, on um, cotton production. And in particular, it has to do with the impact of Ligus on the plant in terms of generating immediate sort of manifestations of damage. So Ligus feeds on cotton. What it feeds on, at least the part of its feeding that generate e generates economic damage, is when it feeds not on the flowers, but on these little tiny flower buds. So very earliest stages in the development of a flower bud. That happens to be a place where Ligus loves to feed. And it generates damage in those flower buds, and the plant may respond to that damage by deciding to not invest any more resources in that developing flower bud. And the result is that that flower bud is of size. Okay, it drops off. So that's the basic, the basic issue was the mapping of lightest densities to the expression of this damage, the decision of these flower buds. And to sort of set up the question, I need to do a little bit of history. 
1996 was a particularly horrendous year for cotton growers in California. Um, there was tremendous crop damage. Pesticide bills went through the roof. Yields were low. And a lot of farmers actually went out of business that year. So it was a very, very bad year. At the end of that year, uh, PPDL called together a sort of round table for all of the major cotton producers to sit down together and talk about what went wrong and then to identify research priorities for the research community. And we, the researchers, were invited just to listen, okay, not to say anything, just to listen. <laughs> so I was sitting there listening, and I heard at that meeting a, 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 an observation from the farmers that, I, that sort of stuck in my mind. And what they said was that unlike other pests on cotton, Ligus was very, um, very curious. It, was, it created what they viewed as an enigma. And that is that sometimes they have lots and lots of Ligus in the field, but very little abscission of flower bugs. So lots of bugs, but very little expression of damage. Whereas in other fields, they had very few Ligus bugs, but they had a lot of abscission of flower bugs. And they didn't understand why. And this uncertainty, this, this sort of lack of clarity regarding the, the damage that Ligus is generating, made them very motivated to manage Ligus in a sort of hyper-aggressive way. Because they were always afraid that maybe my field was going to be the one that shows this great sensitivity to Ligus. So I didn't understand what was going on then. And I wasn't working on Ligus at that time. But I sort of saved that, that question. Some years later, James Hagler showed something very interesting about Ligus, which was surprising to us, which was he showed that Ligus is not a strict herbivore, but rather it's an omnivore. So it sometimes feeds as an herbivore, and sometimes it feeds as a predator. Um, we knew from work that um, Anurag Agarwal had done actually here, that many omnivores can switch back and forth between acting primarily as an herbivore to acting primarily as a predator. So I put these observations together and I sort of came up with my pet hypothesis, which was maybe this enigmatic impact of Ligus was due to the fact that it was shifting back and forth between acting as a herbivore and acting as a predator. So we wrote some grant proposals, we started working on this, we spent one year very intensively studying Ligus feeding behavior, and we found out very quickly, no, that is not the answer. It was a complete dead end, at least under conditions of California cotton, Ligus are not acting as a predator. So we had to sort of go back to the drawing board. And we sat down and we said, OK, if it's not omnivory that's underlying this, what could it be? And that was a very sobering exercise, because what we realized was there's a huge number of possibilities. And we could group those possibilities under these four sort of classes of hypotheses. Um, maybe the problem is one of observational uncertainty. Maybe there's some problem in sampling the density of ligus in fields or sampling crop damage. It could also be variable behavior of the herbivore. So ligus acting as an omnivore is one possible basis for variable herbivore behavior, but there could be many others. It could instead be variable behavior or responsiveness of the plant. Maybe ligus is generating a consistent amount of damage, but the plant then varies in its response to that damage. And finally, there could be what could be called model uncertainty. Maybe our basic characterization of what's going on here is wrong. And in particular, we were thinking maybe there was some other arthropod present that's also feeding on the, on the flower buds, and that Ligus is sort of inter inappropriately getting the blame for the damage that this other insect was causing. So four classes of explanations, probably a list of specific hypotheses that is as long as your arm. What do we do? It was very daunting. How do we start with such a vast array of possibilities? And so what we decided to do was a small-scale observational study to try and screen, to sort of sift through this long list of possibilities. So here's what we did. We said, let's work with farmers and consultants. As soon as they identify a field as being enigmatic in some way, we're going to get a phone call from them, and we're going to zoom down, and we're going to measure as many things in that field as we can. This was actually work that Kim Steinman was here um, spearheaded a lot of this the field work. Um, and we measured everything that we could. We had no idea what we were doing. It was a complete fishing expedition. Okay? So we measured well in excess of 30 variables, including ligus densities. We quantified the feeding damage. So we actually took flower buds, dissected them, and we counted the number of anther sacs, so the developing male parts of the flower that were fed on. It was a very nice way of quantifying feeding damage. 
we measured as many things we, as we could about plant uh, condition, thinking that we would potentially find a correlate with plant responsiveness advantage. And we also sampled all the other insects that were in the field to see if there was some other culprit. Very small data set. Okay? It took all summer. There was a team of three or four people working the whole time. We only managed to gather all of these data for 21 fields. So it's a very small data set for an intimidatingly large list of variables. But nevertheless, we did get some useful insights. Not rock solid conclusions, but at least some useful suggestions. So here's our, here they were. The first result was that observational uncertainty did not seem to be the key answer here. Um, and there's sort of two parts to this. First, our density estimates were highly correlated with the density estimates that the farmers and the consultants were making. They're not exactly the same numbers. In fact, so we are speaking a different language. This gets back to that issue of how do you make recommendations. So we were mining, for instance, six times as many nymphs as the consultants were finding. Not surprising, because they have to go through these fields very, very quickly, whereas we as researchers can you know, pick through our sweet net samples and find these very conspicuous nymphs. But nevertheless, a high density field that they sort of recognize, we would also categorize it as a high density field. When the consultants said the densities are low, we found that the, the, the densities were low. So certainly very tight agreement on that score. And furthermore, we were seeing exactly the same deviations from expected flower excision that the farmers were seeing. So their categorization of a field as enigmatic matched exactly our categorization of a field as enigmatic. So I'm plotting here the de density of analytis in the fields versus flower bud retention. And you can see that there's a negative relationship here, but it's noisy. And sure enough, these um, solid symbols here are the fields that, ha that the farmers considered to have higher abscission than they would expect. And sure enough, those fields do cluster at the bottom of this sort of plot of points. The little plus symbols here are fields that had abscission that the farmers considered to be as expected. And these open circles were fields that the farmers considered to have less abscission than expected. So basically, the way the farmers were reading this was exactly the way we would read it. So, so far, so good. Maybe sampling isn't the problem. The second inference that we got was that it also did not seem like variable herbivore behavior was the key issue. So here I'm plotting adult mitis density versus the number of anthers that are damaged. This is a direct measure of feeding damage. And you can see that there's a positive relationship here. It's noisy, but positive. But the different categories of fields are all scrambled up together. So there's no field type effect here at all. So there's no suggestion then that the strangely high incision fields were due to those fields responding with more abscission to a given level of damage. So the ligus are doing just what they're supposed to be doing. They're chewing on these uh, squares. It also looked like we could um, rule out, at least tentatively, the idea that there was some other insect that was generating the damage. So what we found was that there was really one other insect that was abundant enough to be a potential culprit, and that was this guy, uh, the big-eyed bug, Geocorus pounds. This, is, this insect is thought of primarily as a predator. It's an important biocontrol agent, but we also know that it is, in fact, an omnivore. It does feed on the plant. So we set up some very simple experiments to quantify plant damage by Geocorus. And yes, there was some, we could measure it, but it was so small that it couldn't possibly be responsible for the damage uh, in the squares that people were observing. So it doesn't look like there's somebody else out there. It really does look like it's like this. And finally, this initial sort of pass did suggest that maybe it was variable behavior of the plant, a variable response of the plant to a given level of damage that was the, the, the root cause of the whole overall phenomenon. So here I'm plotting the anther sac damage. So this is the feeding damage to the squares versus flower bud retention. And you can see that there's a downward trend here. And it's noisy. But again, and it's a little bit messy here, this is only sort of marginally significant, that these um, solid symbols here, the fields that had higher abscission than expected, tended to cluster towards the bottom of this cloud of points. So the plants seem to be responding to a given level of damage with more abscission. Why? So this then motivated us to try and look carefully at all of the variables that we measured that described plant condition. And when we did that, one variable jumped out, which was phosphorus nutrition. So here's petiole phosphate level versus the deviation between 
observed the decision to follow buds and the expected um, level of flower bud abscission based on the density of ligase. And what you see is this relatively strong negative relationship. Now this was completely unexpected. You know, this was one of probably 15 variables that we measured that described the plant condition. Um, there's a very extensive literature on the physiology of abscission in cotton plants. Cotton was actually sort of a model plant for studying plant abscission responses. And nowhere in that book is there any suggestion that there might be a role for phosphorus. When we shopped this result around to the cotton agronomists, we just got shrugs. Nobody had any idea why this might be important. So we were a little bit dumbfounded by this. And given that we had done this massive fishing expedition, we didn't have any confidence whatsoever that this was real. But there it was. So we thought we should at least pursue it. And we did. And here's what we found. So the first thing we did was we generated an independent data set, observational data set, this time for actually a different species of cotton. This is Kimba cotton, Cyprian Bonavents. And we found exactly the same pattern. Higher levels of phosphorus nutrition, greater abscission of squares. So okay, maybe something really is going on here. I then um, had the good fortune of having um, Andrew Forbes join me on this project, a postdoc on the project. And Andrew um, did a very good and careful literature search and found something that we hadn't found, which was that indeed there was some precedent for a role of phosphorus in abscission responses, not for cotton, but for of all things, olives. So work that was actually done here in the agronomy department where they were searching for a chemical harvest aid for olives. They wanted to figure out a, a good way to mechanically harvest olives. So they were snipping off the tips of olive branches, sticking it in little water picks and spraying different things on those, those chopped off branches to see what would enhance the, the abscission of the olive root. And by accident, they found that when they had phosphoric acid in the water pick, just to maintain the pH in a, at the appropriate level, the little branches dropped all of their leaves and fruits. Totally unexpected. They still no explanation for this, but they've actually gone on and shown that this response seems to be very broadly found within the plant, the plant kingdom. So somehow phosphorus has had an effect. And Andrew then went on and did a, you know, a tightly controlled experiment where he grew plants under low phosphorus conditions and high phosphorus conditions. And sure enough, we get a very strong um, variable response to damage in terms of flowers. Okay, so I, what I hope then I've suggested um, from this first example is that even a very, very small data set, 21 field sample, really enabled us in this case to make some serious sort of progress on this problem. We started with a long list of hypotheses it would have been completely impossible to start with experiments to address each of those possible scenarios. Okay. Yeah? What led you to test for phosphorus? We, oh. just, we just measured everything we could. There were, this was completely undirected. There was no insight involved in this at all. None. Yeah, but is it, you know, I think that they thought, I mean, is it, is it a variable thing? So it's, it's so so where is this variability in phosphorus coming from? And this maybe is one of the reasons that it was even more perplexing. Typical commercial production of cotton, the cotton crop is not fertilized with phosphorus. Most people assume that there's excess phosphorus available. They don't fertilize cotton with phosphorus. So almost all of the variability that we find in the field is due to the <coughs> rotational history of the field. So it depends on what was grown there before and if that was a crop that does get phosphorus fertilizer, then there's typically higher levels of residual phosphorus in the soil. And that was actually something that we pursued with the eco-informatics side. So the whole thing is based on sort of history of crop rotation. And maybe if it had been, maybe people would have figured out long ago what was going on. Okay, so um, so that's the story, this first part of the story. You know, we had this big black box, we did this fishing expedition, and the observational study really enabled us to sort through this vast range of possibilities. I had an interesting experience trying to publish this work. 
um, the editor wrote to me about this initial observational survey that it presents precious little good hard scientific evidence. <laughs> and of course, initially I was sort of aggravated by this, but you know, on the other hand, basically I agree. It, it did provide precious little good hard scientific evidence. But nevertheless, the soft evidence that it, presu that it did presu pr provide us with was essential to the progress of the overall project. So we needed it even though it was soft. And so I think part of what we need to do is sort of change kind of the culture of our community to say, okay, yes, observational studies are not as rigorous and robust as experimental studies, but nevertheless, they can be useful. Okay, so, Jimmy, yeah. don't try and publish in science with that data. This was not science I was trying to <laughs> Okay, last part. Um, so here's an example of where a larger data set um, can play, I think, a particularly useful uh, role. So this is the eco-informatics approach. Um, again, the focus here will be on the impact of ligus on cotton production. But now we're going to focus directly on the effect of ligus on yield. And let me set this question up again with a little bit of history. So there's been a long, um, hot controversy regarding the relationship between ligus densities and cotton yield. And I, this, most of this happened before I was uh, you know, out of school. Um, there's a long history of experimental studies um, stretching back close to 50 years at this point. The important sort of bottom line from these experimental studies, and there's probably been at least 10 of them, is that none of these studies has shown any yield effects for ligus at densities less than 10 per standard sweep sample, okay? which is a, what most people would consider to be a pretty high density. But the growers are very skeptical of this experimental result. And the growers typically treat at much lower densities, sometimes three or four ligus per sweep, sometimes lower. Um, so this has been sort of, I would say, like a festering problem in pest management in cotton. If you have to treat for ligus, it wrecks biocontrol of all the other pests. So ligus is really sort of a key player here. But the experiments are very, very difficult to conduct. Ligus is very mobile and it's resistant to a lot of different insecticides. It's very difficult to manipulate this density. So we thought maybe we can approach this question by working with grower data. Let's not try to run experiment number 11. Let's try something sort of different. So the approach that we thought was, let's see if we can build a large observational data set. We knew that we were going to have some challenges here because ligus is just one of many factors that could shape yield. So we knew we were going to need a lot of data to cope with the variability in, in yield. So we set out to build a database. We worked with leading independent pest control consultants in the valley. Luckily, everybody samples ligus the same way. That made this much, much easier to do. And we tried to sort of diversify the data streams as much as we could. So we had data on ligus density from the consultants, crop yield from the farmers, and then we tried to add in as much as we could. So from agronomy consultants, we got information about flower blood retention, we got information on plant nutrient status. From the Department of Pesticide Regulation, which maintains this beautiful online database, we got information about pesticide use. From the farmers, we got all sorts of information about their farming practices, neighboring <laughs> crops, history of crop rotation, which I've already mentioned, and the historical yield norms, which is crucial for this study. And we managed to get data for a little bit over um, 1,000 fields. So doing the data ourselves all summer, 20 fields, now working with other people's data, 1,000 fields. So we did quite a bit better. Um, one key step, when I started this project, I was hopelessly naive about what was involved in building an efficient database. Um, Jim Jones and his company, um, 1011 Business Solutions, rescued us. So the database that Jim designed was crucial in allowing us to work with the data in an efficient way, detect the errors of data entry, correct them, digest the data, report the data. This was absolutely crucial. And the database that we ended up with has really been quite versatile. I don't have time to go through all these things today, but I want to just point out that we can use this now to do very all sorts of things. So it played a role in unraveling this phosphorus line story. We've, um, Kevin Gross did a really nice project documenting the pesticide treadmill in this system. So if you have to spray early for ligus, what are the consequences? Um, Francis Sivakov used a chunk of this data to analyze the landscape ecology of ligus. So what are the effects of the neighboring crops? So we've, we've really done quite a bit with this, and we're continuing to work with this. 
But let me now focus on the ill effects of lights. So the first thing that we had to do was try to convince the skeptics that the basic quality of the data was bad. And so we did that by looking at the relationship between Linus numbers and square retention. We expect a strong negative relationship here. There aren't that many things that cause plants to, to size uh, squares. It's not just Linus. But we do see, happily, a very strong negative correlation here. And this we see this any way we slice the data. So that was, was sort of reassuring to us that you know, the data were OK. So now let's take a look at the yield effects. And we'll start with the month of July. I start with the month of July because that's the month during which almost, well, the vast majority of the pesticide applications go on during July. And here's what we found. So I'm plotting the mean density of ligus during the month of July versus cotton yield. And again, I'm expressing this as a deviation between what we observe and what we're expecting to see based on the historical uh, yield norms for that particular field and also statistically controlling for year-to-year -year fluctuations in yield. Each point here is one field. The curvy line here is the result of a generalized additive model fit. So it's basically just a fit that follows the data. And we're not imposing any particular form on this relationship. And this shaded region is the 95% confidence interval. What you can see here is there is no effect. We cannot detect any effect of ligus densities on cotton yield when those ligus are feeding on the cotton during the month of July. So this is entirely consistent with the results of the experimental studies, which also showed no detectable effect of ligus on yield below densities of around 10. Okay, so that was sort of interesting. It's noteworthy because the farmers are spraying down here. Okay, the farmers are spraying their so aggressive in their response to ligus that they're treating these fields way before the densities of the ligus populations are actually threatened for their yield. And some, to sort of do some quick back of the envelope calculations, it's probably on the order of $20 million per year that is sort of being thrown away in these unnecessary applications. So 50 years of debate about ligus impact, maybe a billion dollars of unnecessary pesticide applications. And they are definitely counterproductive. They create other kinds of problems. These data also show us, I think, a key weakness in the eco-informatics approach, which is that we know that eventually this curve is going to bend down. We've all seen fields where the yield actually just goes to zero because the ligus not every single flower bud off the plants. But we cannot quantify that response here because the farming community is so aggressive that they never let the lightest even approach the densities at which there's actually a measurable yield impact. So this is sort of a constraint. You know, if we had done it experimentally, we could push the densities up here, but we can't even only work with what we have in the real sort of setting. So let's now move one month earlier to the month of June. And what we see here was maybe more surprising and um, quite different. So what we're seeing now is a very clear negative effect of, of ligus density on yield and at densities that are much lower than those that the experiments identified as being problematic. So remember, the experiments said we have to be out here somewhere before we get a yield effect. But here we're seeing clear drops in yield even for painfully low densities of ligus. So the farmers were actually incurring yield loss without knowing it all of these years. Again, probably at least a billion dollars in lost yield over the 50 years that entomologists have been arguing about this kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Can I forget about what you mean by expected and observed minus expected? So the expected yield here is um, we're using the historical record of yield observed for a particular field. So we actually, and we express that relative to the value-wide average for a particular year. And we did this because, and this is part of the statistics that I'm sort of glossing over, there are always challenges in you know, moving from, again, correlation to causation. Um, so we wanted to work with deviations from expectations to minimize the chance that there was some correlation between, let's say, plant vigor and ligus density. That's why it worked Did out. you look for correlations between ligus density and the stuff that was going into your expectations? Correlations between As opposed to stuff that was going into your observation. Yeah. So, so you're, you're attributing it to you know, this particularly bad year, but maybe right. it could be 
that there were more yeah. ligands that year. Right. So there isn't there de there isn't any particular correlation between ligase density and the overall year. The the the, diff the effect of weather is huge. It has a lot to do with when they can plant the crop. There, yeah. So those things I think are pretty important. Yeah. Jay, can I ask one more? Yeah. The word early. How does that relate to first bloom or first bud? This is basically pre-bloom. Pre-bud. It's not pre-bud. So they only start sampling ligus when the flower buds are there, because before that, nobody cares about ligus's impact. Um, so this is basically the first flower buds are present and vulnerable, typically around the end of May, which, oh, is, actually, okay. which is actually included here. Mm -hmm. And usually the first bloom is around the end of June. So this is the earliest part of fruiting. OK, so I'm just about done here. So here's the summary of part four. Um, so we worked then with this eco-informatics framework um, to incorporate data streams from consultants and farmers and other sources to create this sort of versatile database. Um, we built a database that was much larger than what we could generate with our own hands. And it really helped us then to sort out this sort of long struggle to understand the impact of life. And we think that farmers have been wasting money on unnecessary sprays and losing yield by not treating the populations as aggressively probably as they should. Okay, so last slide. I think applied insect ecologists, you know, we have plenty of challenges. The problems that we work on are complex. Um, agricultural communities are not as simple as people like to pretend they are. Um, experimentation, I think like any other approach in science, has both strengths and weaknesses. And what I've tried to argue is that we can find in observational studies and in these eco-informatics approaches um, insights that can complement the weaknesses of experimentation. And I think that by pooling these approaches and working with them hand in hand, that we can make, I think, better progress in solving the problems. So thanks very much.